Glory to the Lamb of God. Holy, holy God.
Take your seat. Take your seat. Take your seat. Even as we worship. Take your seat, oh God. Take your seat. You inhabit the praises. You inhabit the praises of your people. Establish your throne tonight. Even as, even as we worship and worship and worship. Even as we worship and worship you. Yeah. Even as we adore, we say, take your seat, oh God. Greetings, saints, in the name of the Lord. Um, it's so good to be back uh, to share the word of the Lord with you. Um, uh, I, I want to 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 straight and go to 
Last week, we were speaking to uh, the issue of uh, a deeper repentance and coming to the presence of the Lord and um, ensuring that uh, we are now fully turned over. I spoke about uh, turning uh, 100, 180 degrees away from our trespasses. So today I want us to speak about on a message called the verdict is you're not guilty. And I'm going to um, uh, uh, speak uh, on the word of the Lord and, and share and teach specifically about how guilt will make us to even forget who we are and also make us to forget what God has given to us as a mandate. But before we, we go to the word, I want us to pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to come before your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you say in your word, we are not guilty because you took away, God, all our offenses and you made us ready, oh God, to become who you wanted us to be from the beginning of time. Thank you, Lord, that, Father, the verdict uh, this morning is we are not guilty. And we thank you, Lord, for the son, for your son, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again. And when he rose, he rose together with us. We thank you and we give you the glory, even as we preach the word of God. Father, may it touch and shift our minds, Lord. May it reconcile us to the mandate that God has given to us. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Now, what I wanted to start with, we'll start with a, a reading from the book of Psalm uh, number 32, verse 1 to 7. The Bible says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto him, unto whom the Lord imputed no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. And, and when I kept uh, silence, my bones waxed all through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Then it is uh, at the end is Sila. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. And it goes Sila again. For these shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest found, mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters. They shall not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. And it ends again, Sila. Now, what I want to, 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 to start with is to explain that our first issue is that after we have uh, reconciled ourselves with God, we struggle with the issue of, issue of being guilty. And our, our, that's our first problem. Guilt does not have uh, to involve horrible sins, though that is possible, but can include feelings of being unworthy of God's love simply because of a multitude of minor infractions, especially because, you know, we as a body of Christ, we have this analogy that says that we, you don't qualify to be loved by God because of your background. You don't qualify to be loved by God because of your past offenses. We judge people based on what they've done, even when God has said uh, he, they have been delivered and they have repented before you. Now, what is guilt? Guilt is, is, is a feeling of having violated a rule or a law or a social standard. It can involve issues in culture, the family, legal issues, and especially offenses related to violating God's standards. Also, guilt can come from a feeling of self-reproach and that can simply be a feeling of being inadequate due to not living up to your own standards. So when we are guilty, we are not guilty just because we have offended God, but sometimes we are guilty because of things that were expected of us that we didn't do. And make an example, when, when, when we raise our kids, I always say to parents, 
raise your kids so that they can become who, who God created them to be from the beginning. But don't raise your kids so that they can become, for an example, a cash cow that is going to recompense you for things that didn't happen to you. For an example, you make a demand on your child to build your house because you, you educated them. That's, then, then, then our children live for the rest of their lives guilty because of those things. So guilt can come from a feeling of self-reproach, uh, uh, either because of things that you committed or sins that you committed in the past, and also feeling inadequate due to not living up to your own standards. So I want to take to, as to take, take it a step further. Guilt also is a major uh, problem in human life, including us children of God. We, are, we live with a guilty conscience and can cause people to do strange things just because they want to compensate. Majority of the time, it leads us away from the faith, especially from experiencing the joy of the Lord. Because the Bible, we need to understand, the joy of the Lord says the joy of the Lord is our strength. That's what the scripture says. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So why do we feel guilty? We feel guilty, as some psychologists would say, that guilt is derived from, it, from our environment. We are made to feel guilty by the false standards that man has set for himself. Some have been, uh, as I've even proposed, that guilt can be removed if all our inhibish inhibitions are, are, are removed. And I want to stay there for a second because when we speak about environment, one of the things that we speak about, we speak in social work, we say uh, human beings live in a social environment. And in the social environment, there are elements which are individuals or people that influence us and make us to do certain things the way that they perceive those things to be done. Uh, they, they, in other words, they socialize us to a certain way of life to the extent that some others even name their children based on circumstances or the things that are occurring around their time. So then, then people live uh, uh, under the false standards that have been set by men or that have been set by others for them. So we live our lives uh, 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 guilty and, and, and we live our lives so guilty that it, it, it stops us from going forward. And when we go forward, we, t we tend to also feel guilty for having achieved certain things. So this is what I want us to understand. Why, why, why do we feel guilty? First, we need to understand that we cannot hide things from God. I don't want to say wrong things only, but things cannot be hidden from God. Because the Bible says, even before you speak or even before you pray, or even before you petition God, God already knows what's in your heart. He knows what you're going to say. So there's no way you can hide from God. I mean, the Bible speaks about Adam and Eve. They hid in the presence of the Lord. And when God called out and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? And he said, I, 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 he, he was hiding because he was naked. Now, it's not because God was asking Adam in the context of saying, I can't see you, where are you? But God was saying, you are not in your position. Where are you? Where, where have you moved away from? Because your position is to be where I have placed you. You are a man that I visit every cool of the day. But when I look at you positionally, you are not there. So when, 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 so God can see, uh, we cannot hide things from God. So in your heart, you know that you are being watched and you will be, you will always be accountable. I always say at church, when we, when I preach uh, at church, I always say the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro the earth, watching over his word to see it being fulfilled. What does that mean? It means we are a word that has been pronounced from the mouth of God or by the mouth of God. So if we have been pronounced from the mouth of God and the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro the earth, watching over his word, it means God is also, also watching over you. Songs, songs that they sing, they say, your eyes are watching over us. So God uh, actually uh, 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 is always around us and inside us. Secondly, you feel guilty because you cannot hide from yourself. That's very pertinent. You are guilty because you can't hide from yourself. You must look in the mirror every morning. You must lie down with your memories every night. So you can't escape, you can't escape from yourself. You can't run away from the things that you have done, or you can't run away from the things that they say about you that make you to feel guilty. You can't run away from uh, uh, being uh, maliciously blamed for things that you have not done. So you find yourself in a space where you feel so guilty about who you are. Sometimes you even feel guilty for our achievements. Sometimes we feel guilty for the things that we have attained. We, we feel guilty for uh, uh, the houses that we have built or the houses that we have bought. We live a life of guilt. 
So you must go forth with your conscience into each and every day. It is true that some people have seared their consciences to the point of not feeling guilty. But the vast majority of us know that we have done things against God and men and we feel guilty about it. And, 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 and saints, what we need to understand is the world is a wash of a society that lives in guilt. It is also a wash of a society that's trying to compensate or to try and cover their tracks or to try and do things so that they can appease or make people pleased about themselves. We live in a world that is actually perpetually reminding us of our guilt. The fact is, you can feel guilty without being guilty. And you can be guilty without feeling guilty. And that's a confused uh, world that we are living in that actually is bringing to us all the time that it says to us, we are a guilty generation. Let's take it a step further. So what, what, what we read in the book of Psalms number 32, where we read, we, we learn uh, about three important things uh, uh, from David. David learned three things, uh, three lessons. First of all, that sin will take you further than you meant to stray. There are offenses that you commit because you committed and you thought, no, I can, I can get away with this. I mean, really, I, I only just tasted a bit of it. And I mean, I won't do it ever again. But David, when he committed his sin with Bathsheba, he never thought for a moment that it would take him so far away from his true fellowship with God. I mean, he took advantage of his position as a king. He took advantage of his authority as a king. But what he forgot is that when all men were required to be at war, he stayed behind and left the war and came and stayed at home. And he's seen walking on the balcony of his palace and he sees this woman. And when he commits the sin, he's committing it and he thinks, I mean, really, this is just going to be a one-time offense. That's my translation. And, and, and he never knew that it would take him so far away from his true fellowship with God. Sin can begin with a mere look like it began with David, but it will end up with you looking around and not knowing where you are. Sin is not just something we do. It is something that moves us away uh, from God than we can even imagine. There are things that you started doing because you were just trying to pleasure yourself for a minute. And when it happened, it started becoming a habit. And it took you so far away from the fellowship with God, just like it did with David. Number two, sin will keep you longer than you meant to stay. I mean, I'm just doing it this for enjoyment, to please my friends. I'm trying to please my family so that they can believe I am part of them. What do you do? And then you find yourself habitually uh, addicted to a habit and it keeps you in that space for the longest of the longest of times. Let's, let's go back to David in Psalms 32. David had no idea that his sin would lead to a pregnancy. Wow. My wife always says, um, uh, 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 whenever we go into the space of um, uh, pregn impregnating people, those people that have the children can never swallow those children. But those children, are, uh, they are born into a space and they invade our space and we need now to take care of everything that consents to them. After the pregnancy, then there was manslaughter of the woman's husband and involved him in headaches and there was heartaches for the rest of his life just because he thought I will get away with it because I am who I am, right? He could not even imagine that it would bring about the death of a newborn baby, something that brought him great sorrow. You see, sin uh, uh, takes you down a path and keeps you much longer than you thought possible. And saints, we need to understand that some of these things begin with small things. They begin with things that you, you always say, you know, if I, if, I, if I do this, I mean, my pastor can't see me, my mother can't see me, no one can see me. I'll just do it once and I'm going to come out and that's the end of it. But we forget that the Bible says in Galatians, God is not mocked. For whatever men sow it, that shall he reap. What am I saying? Whatever thing that I do will come and catch up with me in the future. Let's go to lesson number three from David. Lesson number three, sin will, will cost you more than you meant to pay. And I know if I ask for someone, for us to lift up our hands and confess, uh, so many hands will be lifted across all the platforms that this ministry is getting to because sin will actually 
cost you more than you meant to pay. Sadly, sin and guilt cost much, much more than one means to pay. David said it cost him more than he meant to pay. Shame was one price, but a higher price was the trouble it brought to his entire family. He was a king. He was an authority. He was a man who was a, a, an opinion given by God, the authority. And God even called him a man after my own heart, chosen by God, very popular in the area. But when he committed that offense, shame was a price. And the higher price was uh, it brought to his entire family. He paid fourfold price for his sin. His guilt was real. But God had a prescription even for the king's terrible sin. And he has a prescription also for your guilt and also for your sin. And I know the popular language now in the church is we don't call sin, sin. We call it guilt. We call it uh, offense. We call it disobedience. But the Bible calls it sin. So I'm going to call it sin. He, God has a prescription for your guilt and God has a prescription for the sin that you have committed. Here was David, a man after God's own heart. But he was experiencing guilt. The man was rich, the man was powerful, the man was popular, and he had a life of pleasure, but it was all stained with the blot of guilt. And, and the evil one has actually a strategy that he uses when he wants to curtail the effectiveness of the body of Christ, the effectiveness of the church. What does he do to the, to the well-known, renowned ministers of the word? He brings in sin and offense. And when sin and offense comes, they, get, they become guilty or we become guilty because I'm part of the clergy. We become guilty and then we find ourselves losing the mandate that God has given to us. We linger behind the shadows of shame. We linger behind the shadows of, uh, of uh, uh, trouble because when people look at us now, they don't see the man of God or the child of God. They see the man who committed a sin. And they, they speak about your offense and they don't speak about what God has called you for. And it's important. And other, and then we then, then the, the evil one will then derail us from the mandate. We begin now to do things that are not supposed to be done. We begin now to pursue richness. We, we now begin to pursue uh, being powerful. We, we begin to pursue a life of pleasure and we forget that God called us for a purpose and a mandate. When he spoke to Jeremiah, you know the scripture. He said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb and I called you by name. And he actually specifically said what he had called him for. And he spoke a very interesting word, which I want the church and I want each and every one of us to remember. The Bible says when God spoke to Jeremiah, he spoke about a, a pulling down. He spoke about destruction. He spoke about a demolition. He spoke about rebuilding again. So it's important that for us to understand that if God has given us a mandate, the mandate requires us to restore the generations that are, 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 have apathy and are lethargic and are not uh, of God to bring them back to the presence of the living God. God has created us. He gave us the mandate to restore all nations back to God. That's why the Bible says, until the nations of this world become the nation of our God. What is God demanding from us? He's saying to us, you need to take your position, but you cannot take your position if you are still lingering behind guilt. Guilt is, is found also, uh, uh, saints, it's found in the best of places. Look at David. David was in the palace. David was, was, was a king uh, sitting in Jerusalem. In the headquarters of Zion, when we praise these days, we speak about the God of Zion. He was the king's, he was in the king's quarters, but it did not keep him from guilt. It doesn't matter how high your station in life is, guilt knows where you live. And someone is saying, this, but why are you hammering us up with the issue of guilt? I'm saying, the reason why I'm preaching that like this, it's because we need to let go of guilt. We need to also understand what guilt looks, what guilt will look like. The second part, Judas. We know Judas, the man who, who, who sold Jesus. Judas was a man who walked with Christ. He was a man that was sitting, sharing and breaking bread with the Christ. He was a man that knew the, 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 the inner business of the ministry of Jesus Christ. He knew uh, where the money was kept and what was required to feed the 5,000. And all of these things were part of his, were part of his jurisdiction. But, but, but the man was, was guilty 
the man, uh, 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 the, the Bible says he was the keeper of the money for the ministry. He was a trusted friend of Christ, but he betrayed the trust. He sold our Lord to the enemy for 30 pieces of silver. Then he planted a kiss of betrayal on the face of our Lord. That feigned kiss so haunted Judas that he placed a rope around his head or his neck and hung himself. This is guilt overwhelmed him. And, and how many of us in the body of Christ or how many of us watching this broadcast this morning are actually lingering behind the shadows of guilt? How many of us actually have a stench or, 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 or they are surrounded by the smell of guilt and they, they cannot move forward? They cannot step out into public. They cannot do what God wants them to do because they are consciously thinking and overwhelmed by guilt to the extent that they now want to hang themselves or they want to divorce themselves from the ministry of, of, of Jesus Christ or the ministry of God. It's important for us to understand that even though guilt will find us in the best of places, God has a plan for guilt. Guilt comes also to the best and the worst of people in the best and the worst of places. Mark chapter number 5 and 16 records that Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist, raised from the dead. It was the guilty conscience of Herod that was haunting him. He was a pagan man, but he was not free from a guilty conscience. So guilt will come to presidents. Guilt will come to prime ministers. Guilt will come to ministers of the world. Guilt will come to fathers and mothers, daughters and sisters and brothers. Every one of us are actually engulfed with the issue of guilt. But we need to understand that it does not take a great sin to create a great guilt. In James 2 and 10, we read that to break one law is to actually break all the laws. So we cannot then and say and say, ah, my sin is a, a little lesser than the other one, so I am not guilty. Sin or offense to God or disobedience to God will bring in our lives guilt. And when we break one law, we have broken all of them. Now, what is the problem with guilt? Ah, what is the problem with guilt? And I want you to understand this. And I'm, I'm saying this uh, because in our time, every time you... You, you watch a broadcast about preaching or about a minister of the gospel. Majority of the time is we are, we are massaging and, and not speaking about the things that are trapping us uh, into a season of the past and are not allowing us to go into the next level. And, and every time you read about it, you find that we are guilty. So David says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old. He says, through my groaning all the day long, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. What am I saying? I'm saying, if God has allowed you to enter this earth and you were born of a woman, you are not a mistake. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter who actually gave birth to you. You were born because God needed you. There's something that he put in you that is necessary for you to actually go to the next level. And the mandate of God is fulfilled. What are you saying for this? I'm saying God saved us or God brought us on earth because there's something that he needed us to do on earth. But then the evil one, because he knows that we are better and stronger if we let go of guilt, what will, we, what will he do? He will trap us. In the, in, in the space or the jail of guilt. David says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old. That's in verse number 3 and 4 of 32 Psalm. But, but the, the, the now forgiven David, remember, he's going back and remembering. And he's remembering his spiritual and mental state when he kept his sin hidden and was silent instead of confessing and repenting. Say it. The silence about what you are going through is not necessarily going to remove the hand of God upon you. Because the Bible says, the word of the Lord will not come out of his mouth and return to him void without accomplishing what he has sent it out to do. So you are not just a product of the word of God, but you are a pronunciation that came from the mouth of God. You were declared by the word of the Lord, by the mouth of God. So you came on earth for purpose. So that's why David said, when I kept silent, my bones grew old. 
He says, uh, 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 I, I could not, uh, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer, which means even though I was guilty of my sin, you did not let go of me. Even though I felt like I didn't deserve the love that you gave to me, but you consistently and persistently, your hand was upon me. What am I saying? I'm saying, David says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. No doubt, David was slow to acknowledge this. Yet in looking back, he understood that his misery was directly connect to, connected to the oppression of unresolved sin and rebellion because, uh, before God. There are things, I always say that the word of the Lord is so powerful. If received and embraced, it brings in conviction. And if it convicts, it means the person who is convicted, if they allow the change of God, they will be delivered. God will take care of everything that concerns us. But the challenge that we have is, we lay heavy with our sin. And we, 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 we don't want to confess it. We don't want to speak to anyone about it and we linger in the shadows and in the darkness that that sin is trapping us into now david says something something fascinating he says my vitality was turned into the drought of summer david's dryness and misery was actually a good thing they demonstrated that he was in fact a son of god and that the covenant of god would not allow him to remain comfortable in habitual and unconfessed sins what am I saying to you? I'm saying, though you have, you have committed an offense, though you have not obeyed God and disobeyed God to his face, the hand of the Lord is still upon you. The covenant that God made with you before you were born is still alive and God still wants to achieve it through you. So what you need to understand is you need to pick yourself up because you are not guilty because Jesus died on the cross. The problem of guilt uh, 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 and then, and, 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 and we, we, we say this when we, when we teach uh, in, in social work and, and, and psychology. I was reading the Encyclopedia of Psychological Problems. Uh, there, is, there is actually a, an Encyclopedia of Psychological Problems by Clyde uh, uh, Naramo. He lists 10 possible results of feeling guilty. Uh, 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 and and I, I'm sure you can, you, can, you, you can measure. So the first one is false good behavior. You know, there is what we call a pretentious living. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm in good behavior. I'm, I think that I'm going to be uh, 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 forg forgiven by God because of my good behavior. It has nothing to do with good behavior. Ask Cornelius in, in the book of Acts. Cornelius, Cornelius, Cornelius uh, was a, a good man. The Bible says when they speak about him, he was a charitable man. He would uh, take care of the poor. He would be a man of, of service. And he was a good man. And the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord sent Peter to come to his house. And when he came to his house, his charities could not save him. God had to bring in a man to preach to his household. And he repented and turned away from the sin. But someone is saying, but what am I turning away from? Because I was a good man. Uh, being good or false good does not make you to be free of guilt. And, and, and he was converted and they were baptized and filled in the Holy Ghost. The second one is physical problems. You, 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 guilt will also make you to be physically unwell. The third one is depression. Guilt will make you depressed. People who live in guilt, you pick up their phone, they run and almost break their legs because they are, they are guilty. And, 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 and depression and, and, they are, and, they are de and they are depressed and indulgence also in sin and continuously, persistently not letting go of things that you are not supposed to do. For an example, I mean when God saves us, I always speak to men about this, when God saves you you know that before you got saved, you had children everywhere and now you are saved and you are married and you've got a, a, a nice spouse and you are lifting up your hands in church I'm using men because I'm also a man and, and, and you are worshipping in church and everything is good. But you forget that there are people who are a product of who you are. That you have not captured and taken care of. You are continuously serving God but you are harboring and not dealing with the sins that you have committed. The, the, the next one, self-condemnation. This one is terrible. Even when God has forgiven you, you are always condemning yourself. The, the next one is self-punishment. The next one is expectation of disapproval. Every time you do good, you expect people to, to disapprove and, and, 
and, and you are always trying to be a perfectionist because of whatever guilt that is there. The next one is fault finding in others. This is critical. You look at others, you're always punching holes and finding fault. You look at the church, you are finding fault and punching holes. You look at your wife, you are punching holes and finding fault. You look at your husband, same thing. You look at your children, you are doing the same thing, finding fault. You are guilty. And the other one is hostility towards other people. And the last one is compensating for guilt by elevating self in society. I'm not going to spend time in dealing with these issues, but I want you to understand sometimes we overcompensate for things that didn't happen to us. And then we elevate ourselves in society and not do what we are supposed to do. And we, 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 we get bogged down in trying to compensate and to show people who we are. But God has not called us to do that. God has not called us to do this. I mean, look at Joseph. After, after he had been uh, 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 disowned by his family, they sold him out to slavery. But do you understand that when he got to a place of proximity and authority, when his brothers came, he didn't elevate himself in society, but the, 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 the anointing and the call of God in his life and the mandate and the vision of God elevated him to his position and he began to serve other people. To understand the problem of guilt, we, we need to understand that God uh, has freely and freely forgiven us and has taken away all the guilt. But the issue is we remain harboring those issues. What did, what did guilt do to David? David was wasting away physically. It was an outward condition. Think about it. People who are guilty... Or we live in guilt and depression. That you find that there are things that are happening on the outside in our body, physically, that are as a consequence of guilt. It was, it was, it, the sin was harming him physically. His body was affected by his behavior. He spoke of this in in Psalm fifty one. He expressed it by saying that he felt as if his bones were breaking. Guilt has an adverse effect upon our bodies. Saints, sometimes the things that are happening in our bodies are as a consequence of a guilt or a guilty lifestyle. Also, guilt will actually affect you and weigh you down spiritually. That is what we call our upward condition. The first one of wasting away physically is our outward condition. But this one is our upward condition. Spirituality was spiraling down in the life of David. He knew he was not as close to God as he should be. And he never, and he never would, would be unless he dealt with the guilt in his life. You, you, you will never be the same in your ministry up until you go back to God and say, Lord, I commit an offense. I, I repent before you. You cannot be in right fellowship with God and refuse to deal with guilt. I believe this is the reason that every great awakening or revival in the world that has ever occurred in history has included weeping, has included repenting by the people who experience the guilt of their sins and the joy of their repentance. What happened in Nineveh? The, the whole city repented because they were guilty of an offense. When, when, when we are guilty, we begin to weep before God. We begin to repent and, we, and, and others would actually be in ashes and sackcloth. They would sit in ashes and wear, and wear sacks uh, uh, because of, of, of their, their offense. And, and that uh, uh, is, 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 is an activity that is precluding that there is a coming of a great revival. That's why when we go to the place of prayer, sometimes we can't help it because tears begin to fall from our eyes. We begin to pray and sometimes uncontrollably so because of the sins that we, 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 we are carrying and leaving them in the presence of the Lord. Look at Isaiah. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and we find him confessing his sin and the sins of his nation. Apparently Isaiah had not fully experienced also the reality of his own wickedness until he came into the presence of the Lord. May we avoid some of the feelings of guilt by keeping, we may avoid uh, 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 some of the feelings of guilt by keeping God at arm's length. But we cannot know the power of God 
in our lives unless we are willing to unmask ourselves before him. I say to the church, and let's go to glory, God has actually helped us to be unmasked. The mask has been removed. God is actually exposing us to the reality that there are better things beyond our guilt. So we need to understand God is at work. God is at hand. God is, God is looking and working in our lives. And this generation wanting to usher a revival needs to go to a place of discarding all forms of guilt and go to God with weeping and praying and ask the Lord to turn the tide and turn things around. Uh, uh, David was weak and also emotional. In, that's our inward condition, inside. David was having emotional issues. If you read Psalm 51, which deals with the same sin and repentance we find in 32, you will know that how he cried out for God to renew a right spirit within him. He was depressed. Take not, cast me not away from your presence. Renew a right spirit within me. He was depressed and perhaps he didn't know why until he opened up to the Lord. David sinned tried to hide it. David could not pray right. David did not feel right. David was physically unable to perform his duties properly. All this was the result of his guilt. Wow! And I, and I, and I, and I was reading about this and thinking to myself that this man was a man chosen from the heart of God. He was, he was the one relegated and not loved in his family, but God still chose him with all that he was. And God consistently was his friend. You see, the, the guilt of David was weighing him down. It affected his heart, his head, and his hope. He needed to know the forgiveness of God in order to overcome the problem of guilt. Many Christians today can be empowered by simply opening up to God and allowing his forgiveness to sweep through our lives. We can also open up to a fellow brother for counsel or a fellow sister. And most of all, allow forgive, forgiveness to flow because guilt will also uh, help, uh, will push you to a place of feeling that God no longer cares or loves you. And, 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 and wow, when, 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 when I started preaching, I said, when I was preparing, when I was preparing for this, I, I, I was thinking in my spirit that uh, if the world is so guilty, and then the church is guilty, then no one is actually fine or fixed to be able to change the world. But there are blessings, wow, that come from the pardon. Uh, uh, from the pardon, there is protection and there is guidance. If you read verse six, six and seven of the same chapter in thirty-two, it says, and, and and God says, "I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you." With my eye. Here David prophetically spoke in God's voice in, unto his people. Through this God promised to instruct. Promised to teach. Promised to guide his people. What am I saying? I'm saying if we let go of guilt. God will instruct us. If we let go of guilt. God will teach us the way we should go. And God will guide our eye. Which means God will be the one that is directing our vision for where to look. I will guide with my eye. The idea of, of is one who waits upon another uh, 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 so attentive, attentively that a mere look at the eye indicates the will. They make an example in one of the books I was reading. A butler who is waiting upon his master at dinner can illustrate this. The master needs only to look at the salt shaker and the butler understands that he wants salt. God promised that for those who diligently seek and focus on God, he will also guide. There is a great, saint, there is a great blessing that comes from being forgiven and having fellowship restored. In David's season of guilt and misery, he did not speak. He did not look upon God for the guidance of his eye. And therefore he could not receive it. When fellowship was restored, the blessing of such close relationship could be enjoyed again. I remember that he spent some time in sack and a cloth and ashes, fasting and not eating while the baby was still sick. When the baby died, the Bible says he cleaned himself up and he began, he began to praise the Lord. We will speak about that some other time. Many modern translators put the sense uh, as merely God watching over the believer, which is true. I spoke about this at the beginning. The eyes of the Lord 
are running to and fro the earth, watching over his word to see it being fulfilled. Yet, since the context in the following lines regards guidance and responsiveness to the Lord, it's fair to render the lines as the King James and New King James versions do. Uh, Saints, that there's just no way. It says here, do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding. The horse and the mule are used as examples of um, of, uh, of of animals that are not easily guided. They need the beat and the bridle, and sometimes rigorous training before they are useful to the master. Uh, 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 else they will not come near you. David understood this to describe his condition in his season of unconfessed sin. He was like a stubborn animal that could only be guided through pain and severity. God allowed the Amalekites to devastate David and his men in 1 Samuel 30. God sent Nathan to speak sharply to David on his sin in 2 Samuel 12. Like a stubborn animal, David would not come near God until he had these three terrible experiences. And you don't want to get there as a child of God. You don't want to get to a place where God will come down for himself to, 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 to be the one that shakes you. Because the, 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 there is the purging, there is the purging of, of guilt, the exposure of sin, which is conviction. Saints, we need to expose our weaknesses. We need to come out in the open and, and, and confess before God. We need, to, we need conviction. False guilt and justified guilt. Oh God, how can you tell the difference between feeling guilty about something that is not real and actually being guilty for something that is real? Some guilt comes from Satan. The devil accuses you, but he never convicts you. He tells you that, uh, that you are no good, but God never tells you that. God convicts you of specific things you have done. In other words, Satan is general in bringing about guilt, while God is specific. But we can be even more precise than this. Listen, you are not guilty. I want to wrap it up like this. You are not guilty. The second part, you need to express your sin. That is confession. David confessed it. Confession means you to say the same thing about your sin or about yourself as what God says about it. It means that you don't gloss it over. You don't say, Lord, it is, but it sounds like it's not. You can you, you call your sin exactly what God says it is. If you disobey God, God calls disobedience sin. If you, if you, if you fornicate, God says a fornication is sin. So we cannot run away and call it and gloss over it. If you've killed someone, you actually, that's, that's murder. You call it murder. You don't gloss over it because God, if you confess your sins with your mouth, God is faithful and just to forgive them uh, 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 those sins. And the, the last one is uh, extermination of sin, which is cleansing. God's son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for you and me to experience forgiveness. Saints, if we are going to go and enter into this revival and a change that we are praying for fervently, forgiveness is important. There is no way Jesus would have suffered as he did. Sin and guilt are serious issues. We cannot be healthy and happy while living with guilt. We know that in psychology. God knew that and made a provision for us to be free of guilt. He does not just save us in order that we can go to heaven. He saves us so that we might have, have an effectiveness and an effective life, unspeakable joy and full of the glory of God. He saves you and me to have life and have it more abundantly. The blessing that God comes with it, the blessing of mercy and joy. Many, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts the Lord, mercy shall surround him. David understood what it was to live at least for a season as the wicked and the sorrows that came with it. So the repentant David then had a renewed experience of the mercy of God surrounding him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. This, this psalm gives repeated compelling reasons uh, uh, for the believer to be glad, to rejoice, to shout for joy. The psalm appropriately ends with a call for God's people to remember and respond to these reasons. Remember the blessedness of forgiveness. Remember the redemption from guilt. Remember the release from the hypocrisy and stress of double living. Remember the protection God gives his people. Remember the guidance from the Lord. 
And I want to end with this. And I want to fervently stress this. The verdict that God gives this morning is that you are not guilty. If you come before him and you confess with your mouth and tell him that, and tell the Lord, Lord, I'm turning away from all forms of guilt and I'm going to obey you from this day forward. For it is better to, to obey than to sacrifice. It is important, saints, that we do not just hold on to positions but we come before the Lord, our God, the great God, and come with the repentance. The guilt has been taken away. You have been forgiven. Jesus died on the cross, and on the third day, he rose again. When he rose on the third day, he rose together with you, and he rose together with me, and he gave us the keys of the kingdom. We are kingdom people. We are not guilty. The world wants us to believe that we are guilty of things we did in the past, but when he died on the cross, we were forgiven. The power of the cross, the verdict that God God gives you this morning you are not guilty let us pray father thank you for the for the not guilty version and verdict lord we thank you because we understand there may be someone watching this program this morning and crying out and saying i'm so guilty that god will not take me but father i want to pray uh, this morning and release the grace of god over this screen oh god arrest their mind oh god in the name of jesus release them oh god from all forms of guilt oh god in the mighty name of jesus father we speak that the verdict god is not guilty father save and heal and deliver in the mighty name of jesus raise us up oh god to the position where you want us to be we believe oh god in the power of your word we believe oh god that you spoke oh god and the worlds uh, and the earth and the heavens were established we thank you, O oh God, that we are created, O oh God, in the image and the likeness of God. And Father, we are rescued. And Father, we are forgiven. And Father, we are not guilty in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with us this morning, uh, I want you to reach out to us. You can reach out to us at 7604-2147 or you can reach us reach us at 7604-8479 and, 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 and you, we will help you to find a home that is going to harbor you, grow you, strengthen you and actually tell you consistently every day that you are not guilty. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.